We got a big episode. Gladiator 2, Bad Boys 3, The Walking Dead's getting three movies. What the fuck? Marvel and DC News. Also, our impressions for the latest trailers of Rocket Man, Overlord, Escape Room, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Hope I pronounced that right. And a quick review of Bohemian Rhapsody. All this and more on this upcoming attractions episode of Midnight Double Feature. Hey man, how we doing? Matthew, 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 what's happening, man? What's I'm cracking? stoked because we actually got some really interesting um, pieces of news this week. Yeah, dude, we do. But before we start, I just want to, I just want to say something. Congratulations on finishing oh. your short film. She's not your type. Seriously, uh- <laughs> um, a massive, a massive congratulations, man. Like. You you worked tirelessly for that shit. You you broke your back, not literally. Um, you know you you've been juggling time frames. You've been juggling with the podcast, um, juggling life, work, uh, and and you know pretty much just breaking your back just to get this movie done, man. So, um, a massive massive congratulations to you, your crew, and your cast um, for getting that done. And I'm really keen to see it, man. You just got into um, the the uh, film festival out here, uh, Made in the West. Um, I'm 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 keen to see what you what you got what you yeah. what, what your how, what your follow up looks like to Bleeding Backs because it was pretty good. So <laughs> thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Like as uh, what the viewer what the listeners won't know, but like it's been a real fucking struggle for me to make the last uh, at least the last three or four episodes um, happen. Just uh, man, I had one of the craziest post productions ever. Like I spent I worked out just on editing alone. I spent about forty hours on it. Just. Uh, trying to do comedy, man, and especially like fast paced punchline type comedy, it's, it's fucking hard. And every time there's a joke, it's like, you gotta make a decision. Do I show the joke? Do I show the reaction? It's, you know, and I, I've, I've definitely cr- developed a much larger appreciation for, um, well-made comedy films. Um, and, uh, yeah, like, I know I'm, I'm going to say, I think bleeding backs will probably still be my calling card for a while. Um, but, uh, this film, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of it. And, uh, and um, I'm just stoked that maybe I can be more a part of what we're doing, man. Hopefully, I can jump on some feature presentations and stuff. Um, now that I actually have a fucking life. <laughs> yeah, we don't really, we don't, we don't really want you on those. Oh, um, it's okay. a bit crowded Ouch. anyway. <laughs> oh, that's awkward. Uh oh. <laughs> no, um, no, um, no. Seriously, like, uh, just, just the massive congratulations. Like, this is, this is what you. This is what you want to do, man. This is also what you're... Uh, sorry, not, when I say this, I don't mean the podcast. I mean filmmaking. Like, this is... That's what you're good at. Like, you know, just... It, it's it's fantastic, <laughs> man. Like, you've got such a passion for it, and it's really... It's it's honestly really inspiring. So, um, keep doing what you're doing, man. Seriously. Thanks, man. I don't know if I'm good at it, but I'm definitely trying. <laughs> you're definitely Anyways, good at it. I've seen, um, I've seen enough to know you're good at it. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, well, we mentioned uh, feature presentations earlier. Let's rewind back so we can make a segue. Um, for those who don't know, this is an upcoming attractions episode. What that means, it's uh, me and Zayab talking about the latest um, movie news, um, stuff that gets us excited, stuff that makes us go, uh. and um, we also talk about our um, thoughts on like latest films that have come out as well. It's all good fun. Um, and for those who want to join join the ride, um, we are on all over social media. We have a community group called the the After Party on Facebook. Make sure to check that out. Our Instagram is really popping these days. Um, and sorry, I forgot to mention as well, the the other type of episode we often do are the feature presentations where we go into an episode, uh, we go into a movie and we'll break it down and go for three, four hours. It's usually Zoheb and Colin, our good mate from the States. Um, we've got a cool episode, um, a special presentation actually with a, with a guest coming up, don't we? Yeah, we do, man. We've um, we're we're covering Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, so you know the the movie that just came out that's uh, all about Freddie Mercury and Queen. Uh, Colin's Colin's just been talking about it for fucking ever. So we just decided to throw him a bone and be like, all right, fuck it, let's do an episode. About yeah, it. <laughs> this is probably Colin's most anticipated film of the year. Would right, you say? and yeah. he's 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 on he's on record for saying that as I'm saying for saying yeah. that as well. Um, so um, yeah, but we're we're covering that. We're not doing a feature presentation. We're going to release it as a special feature. Um, um, so 
it's it's not going to be a scene by scene sort of um, walkthrough of the movie like we always do with with uh, the the big ones. It's cr- probably going to be a more sort of Avengers Infinity War style thing where we we don't we're not going to be going by character. Um, it's just kind of like an overview of the movie, but still kind of in depth um, and just sort of like giving our non spoiler thoughts first, and then um, giving our spoiler thoughts on it and what we thought and how uh, how we how good we thought the movie was in terms of sort of portraying Queen and portraying Freddie Mercury um, and and things like that. So we're really excited to do that with Patrick Harrington, um, who is a great friend of the show. He's amazing. Um, And he's got his own podcast, uh, Married People Watch Movies, uh, which he does with his wife. It's fantastic. Shout outs Um, to Married People Watch Watching Movies. Is it watching or watch watch movies? Let's get that mixed up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, it's good, man. Yeah. For sure. um, yeah, and so for those uh, checking us out, though, thank you. Um, I'll give me and Zoheb will give our brief overall thoughts, um, and they will include spoilers later on. But um, if you like that, and you want some more, um, especially from some other people as well, um, make sure you check out that special presentation where, we, where um, the guys go all de- deep into that. And um, Zoe, maybe you can pass on my comments to Colin and. Maybe you can swear at me if if he ever disagrees and stuff. <laughs> uh, right, I'll be doing that, yeah. man. Don't worry. Um, anyways, let's jump into some news, right? Um, bro, I want to start off with what I think is kind of bonkers. Um, one of... Uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on Ridley Scott for the people who don't know? Yeah, not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> that's... Uh, that's it's, I know that's controversial. Um, look, I like... I, I like a, a few of his movies. I don't like most of his movies. Um, he, he has had a bad run. I wouldn't say it's Shyamalan level bad. I, no, I no. tend to like him a lot more than you do. Um, yeah, uh, and a lot of people do. Like he, it's not that he has a bad run. It's just it's very inconsistent. Like like let me. I only like a few movies of his, and I'll tell you which ones. Um, obviously, I like Alien because Alien is amazing. Uh, I love Blade Runner. Uh, I love Gladiator. Uh, and I love uh, American Gangster. Um, I, I was going to say, what about 2049? But I just remembered he doesn't direct that, does he? No, he didn't direct that. And I really, yeah. sorry, I really like Black Hawk Down as well. Mm. Um, but other than that, I, I think he's a wildly inconsistent director. Um, he, you know, he, let, let me read off like some of the last few ones that he did. I, okay. I like okay. all the money, well, all the money in the on world. Me, lay him on me and like, yeah. uh, we'll, 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 we'll like compare yeah, okay. that. I liked all the money in the world. So it was pretty it. decent. Okay. Alien Covenant. Uh, you know, at Didn't a good like beginning and end, just everything yeah. in the middle was like, uh, I not what I wanted. just wasn't feeling it. Wasn't feeling it. Uh, everyone loves The Martian. I just thought it was a bit overrated. I love The Martian. Exodus, Gods and Kings. Didn't love it. Um, I don't the, think many people did. The Counselor. I talked about The Counselor on this last po- last podcast that we did with uh, when we covered uh, No Country for Old Men. One of the most disappointing cinema experiences of my life. Wow. Hated, hated that movie. Uh, I've, Prometheus. I haven't seen that one. Uh, Prometheus. You know, it's got some good ideas, but um, it's yeah, not what we man. wanted. Yeah. Uh, Robin Hood. No. <laughs> Did he direct but, that Robin? Is that the one with Russell Crowe? Russell Crowe, yeah. Oh, uh, Body of Lies. That might be the weakest Leonardo DiCaprio movie I've ever seen. Um, American Gangster. Again, I said it was pretty good. I haven't seen a good year. Kingdom and Kingdom of Heaven is okay. Matchstick Men. I haven't seen Black Hawk Down. And like I said, is pretty good. Hannibal is not great. Gladiator is amazing. G.I. Jane. G.I. Jane. Haven't seen. Fourteen ninety two. Haven't seen. Uh, Thelma, and, Thelma and Louise. I haven't seen, but I heard it's good. So I'm just gonna yeah, I'm, play that out. I'm there. the same boat there. Um, he did Legend. Um, I haven't seen it, but you know that apparently is like a cult classic. And the Duelists. Um, so haven't seen that either. But yeah, wildly inconsistent, very overrated for me. Other than those like four movies that I mentioned, um, you know, and I can see like, come on, he changed cinema with Alien, and he changed cinema with Blade Runner. He really did. Like, and I, I'd yeah. say Gladiator is maybe yeah, it didn't absolutely. change cinema, but it's up. It's definitely up there. Like right. a lot of people's top, maybe ten to twenty. Best picture winner, dude. Yeah. Like, it's... And speaking of it, oh, you know, like, you actually make a good argument there. When you when you list them all, I'm like, oh, some of those I didn't even know he directed or even heard about, to be honest. But you got to love him for the classics. Um, he's not... De- he's definitely not going down the Steven Spielberg path where he just... It's just hit after hit. Although I feel The Martian was a really good... Uh, it's it almost like a comeback, but I understand you don't like that. 
But um, that's okay, man. But like speaking about Gladiator, this news is just it's kind of bonkers to me. Um, it's Ridley Scott is officially developing a sequel to Gladiator. Um, now, so it's almost twenty years since that film, and um, it, it kind of makes no surprise in a way when you think about it. Considering that there was, um, he directed Alien Covenant, produced Blade Runner 2049, which are both like kind of long past sequels to previous films of his. Um, now we got, a, uh, we got, we got, we got something being told about what it's about. I'm not going to read out the whole thing. The idea is, is this character, his name's, I think it's Lucius. And mm-hmm. what yeah, happened? Yeah, he was in the first one. Yeah, yeah. So it's him all grown up now, and he's all like, "Oh, remember the memory of Maximus? <laughs> and he was so great, and he did so many good things. And now I'm gonna fight in his name against the the son of the the bad guy. The, I forget his name from the from the original. Um, and yeah, now it's uh, kind of like com- Commodus. Yeah. It, it kind of sounds a bit like, I guess, Creed Two in the way where it's like. <laughs> It's like we're gonna fight each other based on our dad's glory and stuff. Um, I get. Like, what do you think of that concept? Like, is yeah, uh, it, I haven't it, really. I, I know. I know. There's a lot riding on it because um, Gladiator again, best picture winner. It, it, to me, um, it so- feels like you're really milking it. It's like I feel like every second scene they're gonna be like, "Hey, remember Maximus? Hey, like, fl- like, yeah. and this flashbacking to like this." 20 year old footage like i really hope they're not just shoving that down our throats but i feel like they have well, to with a film like this well one thing one thing that i give uh ridley scott props for is that when he makes a movie they do have production value like like he he yeah. makes amazing like looking gorgeous fucking films and i i don't I don't see it being um, very, very conventional. Uh, it might be. It might be an Exodus, Gods and Kings, which is very conventional. But um, I, I don't know. I don't really have many thoughts about this. I know there are people out there who are very vocal about it, not getting a Gladiator sequel. Because, like, <laughs> when Gladiator came out, there was actually plans for a sequel. And, yeah. dude, um, do, do you want me to tell- Do you know what the plans were? So, they're fucking wild. So, I remember reading about this, like, more than five years ago. And I'm just going to go off memory here and feel free to fill in the blanks for me and correct me and stuff, right? But apparently it was going to start with, like, Russell Crowe. Oh, no, so, 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 I think it was, it was originally written because there was demand for a sequel, but, like, a lot of the creative force behind it were like, no, there's no way. Like, we killed off Maximus. But the studio was like, no, we want a sequel. We want a sequel, so give us something. So they quickly penned a script knowing it wasn't going to be good um, with that in mind. And it ended up being something like Russell Crowe wakes up. He's like, oh, where am I? And it's like, you're dead. This is like the netherworld or some shit. And then- No, you're right. Yeah. And then like, what is it? Like he fights like gods and shit to get back to life. Yeah. It gets like super, like really supernatural. So it's it's like like God of War, except he's trying to fight his way out of hell. Look, I'm going to be honest. You, you you, You throw a bunch of CGI in that today and you say that it's like a it's a popcorn flick and not like an oscar winning sort of film i'm down that, that could sound like a fun time but that's not gladiator you may as well change the name um and i'm so i'm really glad they're not doing that because i feel like that would sort of tarnish the legacy of that film a little bit like it would just cheapen it a little bit um it was did I, was I missing anything there? It was basically him just fighting gods to no, get out of hell, that's right? That's the gist of it. Like, yeah, no, like, that's, that's the gist of it. Yeah, it's fucking bonkers. But I I can understand why. Like, if you're a screenwriter and go, shit, how do I bring Russell Crowe back from the dead? That'd be one way to do it, I guess. Um, here's a question: Do you think in this film, with the script they're going with now, are they going to somehow bring back Russell Crowe or incorporate him in the story somehow, or do you think they do it all without him? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I, um, Ridley Scott seems to be doing this kind of thing with his with his franchises. Um, you know where he incorporates like the the original character or tries to as much as he can. Um, like look at look at Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Although he didn't direct it, he certainly produced it. Um, and you know Harrison Ford was a big part of that, but he was a good part of it. 
Um, and in Alien, uh, you can tell in Alien Covenant, Covenant, he's trying to close the gap because Alien Covenant is technically a prequel. He's trying to close the gap between that and Alien. Yeah. So it, it it might be it might be it's it's likely, um, but I don't know. Uh, like it's it's way too early to tell. Like there's no trailers, there's no footage or anything like that. Yeah, I, I really hope they don't. Or if they do, it's like. Maybe it's a flashback or, or it's something very loose, like, because um, I, I get it. Like, it's really tempting to put in a huge star like that and things, but I don't under- I don't see how they could do a story with him, but I'm, please prove me wrong. Like, maybe he cheated death and they faked his death or something. Like, I don't know. Just whatever they do, I hope they make it believable and keep it, um, I hope they keep it truthful to what the original source film was. And they 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 honor that you know, um, because it I think it's they can get into oh. really they can get into really like weird territory there if not, um. But let's move on. Um, I want to talk about some cool DC news. Um, hey, DC. <laughs> um, so <laughs> could go either way. <laughs> the, the, yeah. Um, well, it's a cool casting. Choice, I reckon. So they're, they're going ahead with this Birds of Prey movie, which, like, I don't get why they just don't make it Suicide Squad, but whatever. Um, and they've, they've, they've cast a villain. They've cast Ewan McGregor um, as uh, Black Mask from, from Batman, which is mm. uh, pretty cool. So, so Ewan McGregor, like, I haven't really seen him do a, like, I know, like a, like a big popcorn flick since, I think, Star Wars, like... Um, He's done a lot of very dramatic and serious roles. And Black Mask, um, who is a, is a very, like, C-list Batman villain, not very popular or well-known. However, he was in the spotlight recently, a few years ago, in the game, uh, I think it was, was Arkham Origins? Yeah, or Arkham Yeah, Arkham, yeah. Origins. Arkham Origins. But that being said, I'm surprised that Black, Black Mask hasn't been brought in earlier because, like, he's, he's pretty much a crime boss. He, like, they could have done him, to do him. They could have easily put him in at the table in The Dark Knight. He's like yeah, alongside right, exactly. Falcone or something. There's nothing too special about him. He's got no superpowers. He's just the guy who wears a mask. And how did you bring that up? It makes me think of some other things like um, one. So the character's known for like wearing a mask that he almost never takes off. But then you cast a big star like Ewan McGregor. And it's kind of like, I don't know, you spend a lot of film without the mask or something. It seems like a weird choice. But also, a lot of these studios, when they pick their characters, they, especially for superhero films and stuff, they try and pick the biggest, most flashiest characters um, for, like, the big trailer moments and CGI fest because, you know, that's what gets butts into seats. But you pick a character like Black Mask and it's, what's he going to do, shoot a gun? Like, it makes yeah, me think. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know. Yeah, may- it- maybe this film's going to be a bit more grounded. Like, Suicide Squad had a grounded element to it. Like, not a lot, but... <laughs> not a lot. <laughs> yeah, but, like, like, but they did use a lot of practical effects, which is kind of rare for a film like that. Um, or maybe what I'm hoping is Black Mask isn't the main villain. Maybe he's alongside someone else. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. All I can say is that I, I really like Ewan McGregor. He was in that in the, in the latest season of Fargo, and yeah. um, as, as he was playing a double role, he was pretty good. But, um, yeah, he's awesome, man. I'll... I'll I'll watch. I'll watch Ewan McGregor in anything. To be honest, give me a fucking Obi Wan movie with him. Yeah, I'll, I would watch the shit out of that man. Yeah. Um, and for people who don't know, the film stars it's Harley Quinn. It's basically her spin off film, um, and she's assisted by two other female heroes, uh, Huntress and Black Canary. So it's kind of like way, a girl squad film type thing. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say Huntress uh, is played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who was also in the same season of Fargo. Oh. With Ewan McGregor, and there were a couple in that movie, cool. uh, in that series, yeah. Well, um, both the characters Huntress and Black Canary have appeared on the TV show Arrow, and- Next. Uh, yeah, I don't really have anything else to say about that. <laughs> they, they, they just were there. <laughs> uh, um, they just appeared. <laughs> neither of them have impressed me too much, even though I do like that show. Um, speaking of which, you did mention Obi-Wan movie. Um, the Boba Fett movie isn't happening. Um, yeah, it's cancelled, and we um, know why, right? It, it's, we have to know why. I think I think there's there's two very obvious reasons. One, yeah. they're already developing a show called. Oh, sorry, three obvious reasons. One, they're already developing a show called The Mandalorian, which would star a character wearing a very similar costume. So, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Two, I wouldn't the be surprised most, if it is Boba, but 
Uh, I don't Although, think it is, but no, I wouldn't be surprised no, if he's it in it. I wouldn't be surprised would, if he makes an appearance or something. Yeah, like they 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 said that he's not. It's not him. Um, and like like it's going to be someone else. But I wouldn't be surprised if they you know chuck a one eighty or uh, some shit. I it's don't know. probably like his son or something. He's or his his dad. It's like oh, it's actually a prequel. And this is his dad, <laughs> John Fett or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like the other the the major obvious reason is after Solo. Disney have gone really skittish on Star Wars. Um, they so they've cancelled this film. They let the show go ahead, but um, they've also publicly stated that they're going to slow down with the films when they originally yeah. planned one a year. Like there was a lot of rumors about Obi Wan films starring Ewan McGregor. Gregor. There was rumors about a Yoda film as well. Um, there was also talks. I don't know if it's still going ahead about another trilogy starring all new characters. Um, I think directed by. Um, was it Ron um, Ron Howard? I think. Ron, wait, what? Was it Ron Howard? He was going to do a trilogy. Uh, no, it's Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson, my bad. Yeah, um, but then um, John Favreau, I think he's got a hand in the Mandalorian. I think was it? He had a hand yeah, in uh, something. John Favreau is doing that TV show. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then yeah, I'd say the third reason, maybe, why they're doing this is so they they right now Disney's main focus. Um, while they're still going headfirst in the movies, they're really, really trying to hype up this streaming service. Like they want to be the next Netflix. And there's a few things they've done. Like we saw them announce a TV show starring Loki as in Tom Hiddleston. Um, and then one starring Elizabeth Olsen, Olsen for um, Scarlet Witch. Um, and this is a very smooth segue. So I deserve a pat in the back. Um, we've announced, they've announced a, a limited series Featuring Falcon and Winter Soldier. Um, that's Anthony Mackie and um, uh, Se- Sebastian. Uh, sorry, save me Stan. Here. Sebastian Stan. Yeah, that's right. Holy shit, that's massive news. Um, yeah, like that's yeah. even bigger than a Loki film. Like that's two of the biggest. Like they're not the main Avengers, but like from the B list Avengers. But like, but even then, those are two of the bigger ones. Like. Yeah. One of them alone, like, like win- give us a Winter Soldier movie or show, or just give, give us me, one episode give starring- Give me a Winter Soldier movie. Yeah. Dude, even just one episode starring one of those characters would be massive. Um, For sure. I lost my shit in Ant-Man the first time a certain Falcon showed up. I'm like, oh, yeah. fuck. Like, that was like, I jumped out of my seat with excitement. Um, yeah, I know, because I was sitting right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I couldn't believe it. Like, and how- that was a well-kept secret. But, dude, like- what do you want to see out of a show starring these two motherfuckers? Uh, I don't know, man. Like, they actually have a pretty pretty good bromance. <laughs> I love this love-hate like, relationship between them. Yeah. It's, yeah it makes it, a great it, buddy cop film. It's definitely in Civil War, like, mostly. Like, um, just the- Do you remember when they're in the car and, like, they both see, like, Captain America hook up with Agent, Agent 13 <laughs> or whatever? And they're just both like nodding and shit, and, <laughs> and um, was it was it like uh, is it Winter Soldier is like, can you move your seat back? And it's like, no. <laughs> um, there's another great line. It's like after Spider Man kicks both their butts, and he, like he says something, and then like Anthony Mac is just like, I hate you, like just out of under his breath. It's so great, um, dude. This is like if I needed another excuse to buy the service, this is it. Right. Holy shit. Exactly. Um. It makes me think if these are the two big characters that everyone says could be picking up the mantle of Captain America, makes me predict that maybe he'll die in the next movie and this takes place after that, or maybe it's or maybe it's not. Maybe they just get sent off on a mission somewhere or whatever. Either way, this is amazing. And and another big piece of news, which was confirmed about this show, and I believe, and I could be wrong, it also applies to the other two. Um, unlike all the other Netflix shows, um, and all the ABC shows, so Shield, Agent Carter. Uh, actually, I'm not sure about Agent Carter, but everything else, um, none of them are actually made by Marvel Studios. Um, they are they are given to another company and they're licensed out pretty much. ABC. Um, yeah, it's usually ABC or um, the Netflix ones. I think that's done by another company. I'm not sure who. Netflix. <laughs> no, I don't think no because they don't have an in-house thing. I think I think it's another company that's distributed by Netflix. I could be wrong though. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, the so 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 Kevin Feige is executive executive producing these shows, um, which means he has his hands in it um, at some extent, and it's made in house at Marvel Studios. 
which means they have access to all of the resources. Um, the problem you see with these other shows, the reason why there's not much crossover is because it's just they've got to set up meetings. They've got to do, they've got to, like literally every time they do something, they've got to sign contracts. This, it's in house. They can do whatever the fuck they want now um, and like do it easily. Um, which is pretty cool. Which is fucking amazing, bro. Like, yeah, man. And it just makes me think, like, since it's done in house now and there's clearly going to be a big budget behind it. It makes me think, are they going to put the same sort of like, are they going to give it the, the Hollywood treatment in terms of budget? Because these are, these are limited runs. They're not big, big orders of episodes. All of them like six or eight um, with massive stars. But like the massive stars, they're not going to want to be in shitty things. So I don't know. I just think like when you look at the Netflix shows, like they're grounded and they're realistic. But that's a lot due to budget, really. Um, and, that's, and that's their way of working around it. But this like. Character like Scarlet Witch, like you need CGI to do her powers. Um, uh, even like sure, sure, Bucky Winter Soldier is just a guy with guns, but like Falcon has to fly. You know, you can you can still cut around that, but like at some point you have to show the motherfucker flying for a couple scenes. You know, um, <laughs> oh man, it just gets me so excited thinking about this. We really I'm live sorry. in the golden age of, of of superhero shit, man. Like yeah, and and TV, dude. Like combine it with like golden age of. Of TV. I mean, like, yes. look at what they, they just did with Daredevil Season 3. Which, by the way, you can go back and listen to. Ah, that's a nice plug. I like it. Ah, Dude, seriously, see? Season 3 really was amazing. Um, Great shit. Good shit. Yeah. So, anyways, let, let's move on. Um, I just want to grab- Let's just give you a quick little thoughts on- um, We've got some images released this week. Um, the There's the Creed 2 poster. And we also got our first look at Henry Cavill as the- I'm going to fuck this up. Gerald, Gerald of River. Just Gerald. Gerald, Gerald, okay, Gerald, um, from the Witcher film. <laughs> oh, um, River? Rivera? Rivera. 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 Whatever, I don't play yeah. those games. So, tell me, what do you think of the Creed 2 poster and Henry Cavill as the Witcher character? Um, it looks a little goofy. I mean, you know, I'm all Henry, for it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for it. Uh, but he doesn't have, like, the, the, the stubble sort of white beard or, like, he doesn't have the scar... Like it just it looks and the wig just looks a little goofy. I don't know about I don't know about it. But I, I mean, I you, this- you know what it reminded me? You know what it reminded me of actually? What? It reminded me of um the way they revealed uh, Joker. I did too. Yeah, the- kind of like an official, kind of like an black. official. But yeah, yeah because like it, it ended with the the Netflix kind of like insignia, the logo. <laughs> so it was like an it was it's not like it's like a, a, a behind the scenes thing. It was like an official reveal. I wonder if that was like that's where the inspiration from. Because they might, because something like that, they can just do in a day and put it out, you know? Um, they could have just recently done that, but inspired by that. Who knows? Um, man, I got to mm. say, I, I got to mention, I saw one of my favorite fucking memes of the year the other day. And it was something just, it was giving shit to Henry Cavill. It's like, they called him like Henry No Mustache Cavill or something like that. And they showed, <laughs> they showed like the picture of this character from The Witcher. He's got a beard and a mustache. Then his photo where he's clean shaven. And they showed a photo of Superman who with with a mustache, but then like uh, it was him. But then they showed the comic where he's clean shaven, so it's like he just keeps flipping shit around. And oh, man, I just thought that was so funny. Um, yeah, I agree. Definitely. I think it's a bit goofy. It it looks like a wig, and I feel like yeah. I, I don't know too much about that game or that character. But just looking at the source material, like he looks too clean cut. He doesn't look like he's gone through yeah. hell. You know, right. Well, maybe maybe he hasn't. We don't know anything about the story. Like, maybe he's just starting out. I don't know. Yeah. Because like, the, the witch is massive. Yeah, I know. I, I get yeah. that. But, yeah, um, you know, it's not like it's terrible, but it's, I don't know, it's nothing that got me too excited. Um, right. Bro, I just want to say that Creed 2 poster is my favorite poster of the year. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah, I'm so excited, it's, dude. For the ones who haven't seen it, seriously, Google Creed 2 movie poster. It's the one where you've got- um. Uh, Michael B. Jordan and Sylvester Stallone on one side, and you've got Ivan Drago yeah. and his son on the other side, and they're staring each other down. It's like that Captain America Civil, Civil War poster. Right, yeah, it's like the Civil War, exactly. Except exactly. it's even cooler. Yeah. It's even cooler, though. <laughs> uh, because literally fucking- uh, I just I just want to see Dolph Lundgren and, and Sylvester Stallone battle it out, but I know they're not going to. You never know. Like, there could be a scene- Like, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for a scene where- the, the the kids fight out and they fight out as well and they're cutting back and forth. Like, that would be such, like, a lit moment for me. But I don't think it's that type of film that would do something uh, like I that. Can, 
I can imagine, like, the kids are just, like, fighting and, like, Dolph Lundgren says something to Sylvester and Sylvester's like, Who the hell are Some fucking intelligible bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and we just still like, yeah, yo, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but uh, uh, I hope he does well because yeah. I'm so excited for this movie. Dude, and uh, this- he got nominated for an Oscar for the first one. So yes. let's hope, let's hope he, he goes for two for two. Yeah, two for two. Let's do it. Um, oh, bro, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw another question at you. That's just got me yeah, thinking. Dude. You, for some reason, stumble into a Hollywood office. Creed 2 does well. Let's imagine it ends the way we think it will, where um, the good guys win, the bad guys like, just lose, and they walk away all sad or whatever. You have to pitch Creed 3. What do you want to see from a Creed 3? I know it's way too early to say that shit, but uh, you're a big fan of these, I know. So what would you want? Oh, boy. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd need to know what the outcome of this movie would be. Well, like- I just gave it to you. So, so let's pretend uh, that it's, yeah, it's just yeah. that he just won and the bad guys just walk away sad. Yeah. Uh, um, and he's fulfilled his father's legacy by avenging him. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, okay. So he, he was successful? He was successful. He beat him fair okay. and square in a boxing ring. Okay, so Creed 3 would go. And if, if it doesn't happen in this movie, which I have a feeling it might, I want Rocky to die. Whoa. Well, As in, like, I mean, from an illness or from, like, like someone kills him, like, punches him and he dies? No, I don't think he should be killed. I think just, like, naturally. Because, like, he had cancer in the first one, so... Um, and I uh, think he's in remission and things like that, so it'll be... It'll make sense for him to go out naturally. And I'd, I'd, I'd like him to go out naturally. Like, from, a, from yeah. like, a, just a fan, as a fan, and, like, from a story perspective, <coughs> I, don't, I don't want to see him killed. Like, he's just such a great character, what if, man. What if, like... I don't know how cancer works. Like maybe he's like fighting in the ring and he wins and then he just falls back and yeah, then he just never wakes up or something. That could, he, like that he could literally happen, goes out swinging. Like that would be that cool. That could happen, but I don't think he's stepping in the ring. I, yeah. just, I think they've made it a point in these movies too, like that he's he's done. Like he's he's yeah, that he's, makes sense. He's he's molding his best friend's um, son to become him pretty yeah. much. So um, yeah, th- that's that's kind of wh- what I want from a third one. But I mean, like I, 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 I don't really know in terms of like a villain or like who he's going to fight. Is there anyone um, from previous Rocky films you think should come back? <laughs> I mean, or a reference to it or something. Like the only one that I can like think of is Clubber Lang, who's <laughs> played by fucking Mr. T. But yeah. I mean, I don't know where that's gonna go. So, yeah. Fuck. what happened with Clubber Lang in those movies? I can't remember. Uh, Clubber Lang got defeated by Rocky in Rocky Three. Right. Um, he just got defeated. He was yeah, uh, he was fucking crazy. Damn. Yeah. Uh, well, let's move on. Speak- speaking about films, um, featuring a based on a classic um bro have you seen this instagram video of will smith for bad boys of course 3? i did man i, I, sh- I shared oh, it in the uh that's someone, right. no, actually, it was someone else shared it someone else shared it in the after party that's where i, I first saw it actually come to yeah. think of it. it wasn't the after party bro it's official it's official <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my question is after oh, watching that video before, before you say that just for listeners who don't know um will smith did a video and on instagram He's pretty new to Instagram. He's only been using it for the last year, but like everything he does is just a viral, amazing art piece. But in this video, he's like, yo, yo, it's official. And he moves the camera and right next to him, it's uh, it's Martin Lawrence. Is that, that's his name, right? Martin Lawrence? Yep, Martin yeah. Martin Lawrence. And there's like, he just, and Will Smith is so hyped that Martin kind of gets a word in. He's like, it's official. It's official. And he calls it um, Bad Boys for Life. Which to me implies yeah. that it's a fourth film, but you know I'll let it slide. Um, and neither of them look like they've aged a day. Yeah. Like, so much. my question is: Is it official? <laughs> <laughs> no, <Nah. laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. Will you might want to say it a bit louder and a well, bit more. That well, like, to me, it's enough. exciting, and I'm glad you said it that way because oh, we've been hearing sure. about I'm this. So excited! They've been talking about forever. This and Rush Hour Four. We've been hearing talking about. Oh, people actors saying this and that for like what feels like a zillion years. And if any movie, if any franchise should have kept going, it was Bad Boys. Like, yeah, Bad yeah, Boys I, Two I is think, one of the best action films out there. Right. And I think I think Michael Bay should have stuck to Bad Boys instead of moving on to Transformers. Oh my but- god, his career. Like yeah. sure, like sure, he's probably made a lot more money selling toys and stuff, but like. He he wouldn't be such like a he wouldn't have been laughed at as the way it is now. Just yeah, unless Those- unless unless Bad Boys goes into like a weird like CGI direction. <laughs> like maybe in bat maybe if they kept going, we'd be up to Bad Boys twelve. Well, and at this point, it would be like 
Fast and the Furious, except- Relax. Stop. <laughs> now. <laughs> I'm halting you right there. Like, but, like, I mean, the first two are not masterpieces by any stretch of the imagination, but, like, they're such a big part of my childhood, man. Like, especially the first one. Um, the first one is one of the- it's one of the funniest fucking movies I've ever seen. <laughs> like, like Martin Lawrence, man, back in his heyday. By the way, he's looking a little chubby these days, by the uh, way. Yeah, I mean, a little like, bit, that's yeah. Not, that's not terrible. I'm a chubby guy. But, uh, hey. Yeah, um, <laughs> like, one of my favorite moments in the first Bad Boys is, like, Martin Lawrence has a fight with his wife, and his wife, like, asks him to sleep downstairs on the couch. And uh, Martin Lawrence, like, meets up with Will Smith the next day and he's like, when I woke up this morning, I had a Power Ranger stuck up my ass. <laughs> <laughs> because his kids uh, are playing with, like, Power Rangers. But, a, like, yeah. A lot of people just- forget this, but back in the day, Martin Lawrence was seen as a stand-up comedy legend. Right. Like a god. He was slaying it. Yeah, I don't know what it. happened. Like, he just he just stepped away for a while or, no, or Even, what? like, he early 2000s, man. Like, Big Mama's House and National Security. Um, but yeah, uh, and obviously Will Smith was a juggernaut back then. Like oh, he's a juggernaut now, I would say still. Yeah, or maybe not as no, much I, as he I, was. I don't but- think right now. But I think I think the late nineties, the mid to late nineties, was his shit. Like straight after Fresh Prince of Bel Air, like he did. Uh, Independence Day did Men in Black, and then unfortunately he hit he hit fucking Wild Wild West. But you know that's he can go instead well of the Matrix. Self. He turned down the Matrix yeah, for Wild Wild West. Yeah. Um, but uh, Bad Boys for Life, man, not directed by Michael Bay, um, oh. directed by Adil El Arbi and Bilal Falah. I didn't know uh, this. What's what's, what's yeah, he behind? Or were they behind? The, those two, I actually had a look at their like little resume. Um, they haven't done shit. <laughs> oh no, are they like indie yeah, directors or something? They're not. They're not first time directors, but they are indie directors. Um, and I don't know where they're getting their kind of like credits because they're like. They're attached to the Beverly Hills Cop 4 movie, so I don't know what's- So, uh, do they have backgrounds in, like, producing or something at least? No, they've directed a movie called Black, which I'm assuming is kind of a a movie that plays on race, but I don't know. And uh, a movie called Image, the the poster looks like an action movie, but other than that, man, they've directed a fucking Wiz Khalifa video and- yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's oh. Fucking whatever. See how it goes. Uh, Joe Carnahan was was originally attached to direct this movie. So Joe Joe Carnahan um, is a pretty decent director. He directed The Grey with Liam Neeson. Uh, he directed The A Team, which I you know I think is a little underrated. It's, it's stupid, but it's fun. Um, but yeah, man, um, I'm I'm fucking keen to see uh, Mike Lowry, Mike Lowry, back with Marcus Bennett uh, in Bad Boys Three because man, I know my gen- my 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 generation's been waiting for this shit for fucking ages. Yeah, man, like. Yeah, so whenever I see a situation like this with a big franchise with a relatively unestablished in Hollywood director, um, it gets me thinking. It gets me thinking like, oh, this is like a director for hire movie, which isn't always a bad, which isn't usually a bad thing. Like, there's so many films are like like that, but it's like it means the producers have a lot to say and stuff. Um, sometimes over the director, but I imagine for a film like this, Will Smith's probably producing it and stuff. Yeah, for sure. And like. Will like Bad Boys is like the type of film where Will Smith just gets to be all out Will Smith, you know? It's like, and then he just gets to be in his element so much. Um, that being said, Will Smith rarely ever steps out of his element, but I feel like the Bad Boys films or any like action film with explosions is so great for him because the the thing that makes Will Smith most entertaining to me is he's like and ah oh, hell no reactions to like <laughs> shit going on um and so as long as we get a few of that like even if the script's not tight even if some things are clunky as long as the action scenes are good and the the chemistry right. between the two leads is still there which is definitely going to be there this film kind of seems like a like a no-brainer like it's right it's going to be hard to fuck this up right for the love for sure. of god don't fuck this up um yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> um so, a little so, worried because it's not Michael Bay, and uh, you know a lot of people won't be saying that. But hey, yeah. Um, look, I got one last piece of big news I really want to touch on, but probably don't have a lot to say about. Um, so, I'm one of the very, very few people on this planet that I know that still watch The Walking Dead. Um, I'm also one of the. Uh, I'm also a few episodes behind. Not many though. And for the second time ever, the Walking Dead Facebook page posts a fucking spoiler 
before the episode, like the same night the episode's released. They did it back in season five for Beth. And now apparently, I'm not sure how, I haven't, I've been trying to avoid spoilers, but the lead character, Rick Grimes, has been somehow removed from the show. Um, I don't know if he's killed off. I don't know if he's just left the group or something. I don't know. I don't want to know until I've seen the episode. Um, and man, what, what was fucking insane to me is that they, so, so they've been sort of implying that publicly that, um, Andrew Lincoln, the guy who played this was leaving the show this year because he was unhappy with the producers. Um, because they, cause there was a very public, um, there was a very public kind of firing. It wasn't really a firing, but they wrote out, um, the guy who plays his son. Um, in the show last season um, due to some like mishap behind the scenes. So they kind of got rid of him pretty quickly and he seemed pretty upset about it. But no, the big news is um, they announced pretty much the second after the show finished, they're making not one, not two, but an entire trilogy of big budget films around The Walking Dead starring Andrew Lincoln. What the fuck? Yeah. They've already got a spin-off show and it's not that successful. Um, this season's really dying, even though they've planned for another 10 seasons, apparently. You're, you're still watching this show? I'm still watching it. You know, f- fun fact, Ugh. I don't know how, but it's still within the top five most watched shows, I think, of all time or on TV right now. One or the other. The yeah, writing this, has really dipped in these last five seasons. This though. this this piece of news uh, was shared by uh, someone on the after party, uh, Clay, Clay Boyington. Um, and I just... <laughs> I kind of shut him down because all I commented was like a gif of like a guy beating a dead horse. <laughs> <laughs> it is I, true I, though. I, like this franchise, right. I think everyone can yeah. agree is beating yeah. a dead horse. Yeah, for sure. So and much. I didn't mean I didn't mean to be rude, Clay. If you are listening, uh, I just like, the the series for me. I stopped after season two. So um, honestly, and I, 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 one of the there like, were multiple this, times. Oh, sorry, go on. Oh, no, I was just gonna say there were multiple times that I tried to jump back into it, but I I couldn't. It was just so it was hard. It was really hard for me. Mm, so. Um, that show did have a few seasons which were pretty bad. I think it started to find its bearings again, but I don't know. I'm just gonna say as well. <coughs> excuse me. Bless you. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, one of the main reasons I kept watching The Walking Dead is because of podcasts. Um, there was this great podcast I used to listen to called I think it's by a network called Bold Move. I'm not I'm not fully sure. I didn't listen to other stuff. Just their Walking Dead one. Um, and then they they were really great. They gave really good insights. I really enjoyed their podcasts. But the last like maybe you think three four years they were like because I started listening to them. I think uh, more than five years ago, or maybe it was five years ago. Whenever it was, um, and they they were like they were ripping on it pretty heavily. Like, look, this show's getting really bad. We're kind of getting sick of wasting our time. Doing like the only reason we keep doing the podcast because the listeners and a lot of listeners were like, Look, we only are watching the show because we like the podcast. And then eventually, after saying they were going to quit for years, one day they were like, Sorry, this is the last season we'll do. We're just over it or rather cover something else. And when that happened, I almost stopped watching too. Uh, that's the power of podcasts, ladies and gentlemen. But yeah, um, look, I'm a sucker. I'm going to watch all these. I don't watch Fear the Walking Dead, um, but. Yeah, this is painful. Yeah, um, let's move on. <laughs> beating a dead horse. You said it the best with that gif, man. Um, right. Anyways, let's 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 move on to some trailers. Um, we're going to touch on four trailers. Let's, let's give you our quick first impressions. Um, doesn't have to be a super speed round, but like, let's let's um, let's, in general, just see jump how we into go. It. Yeah. Um. So so a great way to I think um start off is so last week we covered a Coen Brothers movie. Um, didn't we? On, yeah, on no feature- country for old men. Yeah, for featured presentation. Um, By the way, now- yeah. Thanks, thanks to uh, Matt from LSG for uh, retweeting our, our tweet. Really appreciate that, man. He he gave us his thoughts on the on the movie. Um, I just wanted to read it out, read it out just quickly. Um, just just because you know Matt's Matt's fucking awesome. We had him on the on the Get Out podcast. Um, after plugging us and sucking our dicks, <laughs> he's like. He, he said, check out our buds, Colin and Zoeb over at MDF Pod. Uh, they covered one of the greats. I'm still not sure how far up greatest of all time I'd place no country. But I still say with total confidence that it's one of the few completely, totally flawless movies I've ever seen. Um, yeah. Yeah, because like I, I started that podcast, like the first like 
the thing I asked Colin, I was like, Colin, is it one of the best movies of all time? Which is, <laughs> which is crazy. Like, to start a podcast with that, like, you know, like, you know, it's going to be a good episode. Yeah. Um, 100%, <laughs> man. Um, so yeah, shouts to Matt from LSG. Um, but yeah, the Coen brothers have another new film. It's coming to Netflix and we just got trailer two. Um, I, me and Zoe were talking before this, like, we completely missed trailer one. Like, I didn't even hear about this. Have, uh, did you know anything about this movie before seeing this trailer? I did hear about Ballad of Buster Scruggs and I did hear about going, uh, it going to Netflix. And I heard, I heard that it was going to be a TV show. Right. Um, so I'm not sure if, because it's a, it's a, it's a six part anthology story, but it's, it's, I think it's been condensed into a movie. Um, and the running time is only two hours 13, so I don't know how it was going to be a TV show. Um, but, yeah, it's the, got, the trailer looks oh, sorry, fantastic. It, it seems to be getting say, really great reviews, I was going to say. Right. I was going to say, the trailer looks fantastic, man. The cast is outstanding. Like, you got Liam Neeson, you got James Franco. Um, who else you got? You got um, fucking, uh, well, what's her name? Uh, Zoe Kazan from, yeah. uh, from uh, Big Sick. Yeah. Um, David Crumholtz, Brendan Gleeson, Clancy Brown, Stephen fucking Root. We've talked about him a couple of times on the podcast. Um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm keen for it. Uh, what do you think? i got a quick question for you, just before you dive yeah. into your thoughts on the trailer. What do you think about big directors and filmmakers moving over to Netflix? Uh, because that happened with Bright, with David Ayer. But I, I think, like, this is this is pretty big, a pretty big scale. Like, this is the Coen brothers. It's fucking pretty big. Yeah, they're, they're, like, one of the most celebrated sets of directors right. out there right now right in contemporary modern cinema at least um yeah man like you know what like netflix have the budget for it and people that's where the people are you know they they want they they want uh filmmakers want their films seen and netflix what's great about netflix from from everything i hear they're very unlike most film studios. They're very light on the on the um, on the script notes. Basically, what they do is like they they often reach out or have someone approach them, and Netflix usually they'll develop a level of trust with them, and they'll be like, "Look, we'll give you the rare opportunity to do whatever the fuck you want, under the condition that you promise it's going to be good." Um, mm. And if you know, it's usually it's someone that, that has a pre-established fan base. It's not usually an unknown director or whatever. Um, sometimes they would just like release a movie like as in, for distribution, like Annihilation in Australia. We didn't get a cinema release. We just got that out here because I thought that'd be the best release platform. So maybe that's happening here. Um, maybe it's not. But um, knowing Netflix, it probably isn't though. Um, yeah, like they, it, it makes sense. Like they're that's where the butts are in seats. And if the filmmakers are content and happy with getting their vision out that way or or the monetary sort of stuff. Why not? Um, there has been some controversy over this, though. Um, come what director it was. I, it wasn't Spielberg. It might have been... Was it Scorsese? I can't remember. It was some director. It was a big director. And they were saying how they felt it was like almost a... Oh, you know what? It was Tarantino, Nolan. I think. And no, he, it was Nolan. Nolan, that's it. No, it was Nolan, yeah. And he was, like, saying it was kind of, like, offensive to cinema because films are meant to be experienced in the cinema. Like, right. Do you agree with that? Like, wh what do you reckon? Uh, I agree with Nolan for the most part, but it does depend what movie. Like, if you have a movie like Dunkirk or Inception that is a, a fucking visual masterpiece <laughs> and um, something that was absolutely made to be seen on the big screen, like, like Blade Runner 2049 or fucking First Man... Um, then those movies absolutely should be seen in the movies. Um, but if you have a movie like, uh, for example, probably this, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, then it might be perfect for the small screen, man. Like, there's like there's a place where they can kind of coexist, uh, even though Netflix, if, the, if movies do start moving out of Netflix, then it's going to start affecting the cinema industry. Um, I but, feel like uh, it already has, man. Like, because when, when you look at it, right... Um, there seems to be, there's a very niche market for smaller films and there's the big mainstream market for big films, but the mil films in between in the middle, they're starting to disappear. And that's where something like Netflix comes in play. Like Coen brothers are amazing directors and they're in the arts and, and, and film communities where that stuff's appreciated. They are walking living legends, but a lot of their films, I don't think are too appreciated by a very general mainstream audience. I feel because that sort of content isn't going to 
leap out at them as much. Um, no matter how, unless you have like a really huge marketing, expensive marketing campaign behind or some sort of Oscar run. So I feel like for filmmakers like the Coen brothers who, this is like actually a really good fit because um, Netflix is going to be stoked because all these people are going to come in for it. Um, and the Coen brothers are going to be stoked because they'll probably be more, there's less pressure on them, I think. Right. And also their films will be more accessible to people that like want to see it. But also like peop- some people, and again, I'm talking very mainstream audiences, they're getting sick of going to cinema because it's so expensive these days. It's a whole thing. They live their busy lives. And Netflix is so convenient. Another great thing about Netflix is when a film comes out and it's brand new, it gets recommended to watch by people who may like it. And Netflix have like this nine little like internal marketing campaign where like it might be shifted to the top so everybody sees it and things like that. So it kind of seems like a no brainer because. So tell me if you agree with this, but like the average person doesn't think of the movies like you and me, where we go, this is the big moment where we go to celebrate, like, you know, if for us, it's an event, you get to go out of your house, you get to meet up with your friend. It's no, a social yeah, experience. Right. Yeah. Like we get a big thing out of it. So I, we, I don't Dude, know about you, but I don't mind paying the extra to, 10 bucks. I used to work at the fucking movies. <laughs> like that was a, a common excuse, like, because the movies are so overpriced. Yeah. Um, every time you'd get like a, a fucking grumpy mother who'd be like, oh, you know, this is a, a treat for my children and like, I'm paying so much money for this like treat. I'm just yeah. like, shut the fuck up. Like, <laughs> just like, I don't give a shit about your problems. Like, come on, you decided to come to the movies. Like, and, and the movies have always traditionally been expensive. So you know, you shouldn't be surprised. But like, yeah, I completely get what you mean, man. Like, um, the movies are generally supposed to be a treat um like people pick and choose their movies very carefully whereas you and i and you know we literally like, see everything it's just yeah, let's, let's fucking go see that like literally we use the cinema as our television <laughs> um, oh fuck that's a great way to put it like we we use the movies the way people would use tv back right when TV what's mattered. on tv today yeah. yeah so because like every sun like almost every sunday i just fucking venture down to my local cinema and just see what's on you know um but, uh, yeah, like, I, I definitely get what you mean. But what do you think of uh, Ballad of Buster Scruggs? Oh, fuck, yeah. Um, yeah, obviously it's great. <laughs> the end. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love, I love, and they do this with a lot of the films, I love the colour, especially, and just the way they, they frame things, and it's clearly their voice. Like, you can see it with all the dialogue and the way that they present stuff with the camera. It's just, it's very them. Um, and honestly, I'm just stoked to see Liam Neeson in another Western because, uh, I know it's a controversial opinion, but I actually liked A Million Ways Die in the West. And, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I liked it. I'd say it was possible. Uh, it was okay. Uh, it, like, wasn't, it wasn't, it, as- ha- it had some major issues. But- right. Because he directed Ted and I, I like Ted. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. I, I, do you hear the story? Uh, this is a slight tangent, but it's a good story. Have you heard how Liam Neeson was cast for that movie? This- uh, no, because, like, Liam Neeson was in Ted as that fucking weird supermarket person. No, that was in Ted 2. Oh, was it? Yeah, oh, okay. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So, this is a fucking amazing story, right? Apparently, in one of the earlier seasons of Family Guy, there was a joke um, that apparently Seth MacFarlane even forgot about, where there was some sort of joke where it's like, oh, um, this is ridiculous, like, Liam Neeson trying to be a we- playing playing in a Western, because- He'll be in a cowboy outfit, but he'll have his Irish accent. And cowboys have this very Yankee, Americanized accent. And all these years later, like, I think it's almost a decade later or something like that, um, they were casting for the film, and Seth MacFarlane was like, oh, Liam Neeson's like an action star, he's intimidating, let's get him. And apparently he had sort of forgotten about that joke, or he probably didn't write it, it was probably one of his writers or something. Um, And then Liam Neeson was like, I would love to be in your film under one condition, I get to keep my Irish accent. That's his like, little, like, <laughs> fuck you to him. And he was like, okay, that's even funnier. Let's do that. Um, Lovely, amazing. Which I think is hilarious. And the fact that he's playing a cowboy again um, mm. is hilarious. Because I've never seen him do an accent. He probably won't do an accent, too. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and I know it's such a minor thing for this film, but I, I think that's, that's kind of charming. Um, but yeah, overall, it's the Coen brothers. Obviously, it's great. Um, let's move on. Um, Let's pro- move on. Probably won't be as long with these other ones. Um, you see the trailer for Rocket Man? 
Yeah, yeah, this this is a this has been out for a while now, so we're just, we're yeah, just getting so, to it so, in typical typical midnight double feature fashion. We're late on everything. Well, honestly, <laughs> I didn't sit and even know. I, I missed this. Only way I knew it is the other day I saw Bohemian Rhapsody, and um, it was played there. I'm like, fuck, there's an Elton John biopic coming out next it looks year. Great. It looks pretty good, right? Um, fucking Taron Taron Egerton, uh, or Egerton, I can't, I don't know how it's pronounced. Uh, who was in the Kingsman movies playing, um, uh, fucking, what's his name? Elton John. Which, Re- you know, I didn't realize that was him. Yeah, it's, it's him. He looks him. good. Um, he looks good. He, he does look good. I think the, but the biggest talking point about this movie though, and we won't spend too much time on it. So I don't know if you know about the behind the scenes issues of Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, yeah. technically it's credited as being directed by, um. Brian fuck, Singer. Brian Singer. But, but he was fired but- in- in the last two weeks of production, right, right, right. He he left. He didn't show up one day. He just he yeah. just completely just went awol. We'll, we'll talk about um, that later for sure. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. But he was replaced with a guy named Dexter Fletcher, um, and Dexter Fletcher directed Rocketman. Oh, I didn't realize. Yeah. Well, you know it's, what? Uh, I feel it looks very fim- similar. Well, I feel like both films seem to have a very vi- similar visual style to them. Similar vibe, yeah. Well, I don't know how much Brian Singer directed. Um, I- I'm sure we'll either we will get into that in our in our review, or probably Colin will in our next episode because I know Colin knows everything about that yeah. movie. So, um, but yeah, like I-, I just thought that was really interesting um, that Dexter Fletcher directed this. I didn't realize. Maybe that's why they 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 got him for it. Um, yeah, probably. But yeah, like um, yeah, man, this movie looks pretty good. Um, I'm not excited. a huge Elton John fan. I only know. A handful of his hits. Um, what made the Bohemian Rhapsody film work for me without giving away my review is like the fact that there were so many fun hits that the film stayed fun. Um, even like to, and that helped like it through like some of its smaller issues. But like um, Rocket Man, like I don't know how many Elton John hits I can think of that would do that for me. I'm sure there's some that I'm not thinking of, but um, he was clearly a voice of, of a particular generation. Um, and a lot of people love and adore the guy. So, yeah, I'm kind of, I don't really know anything about his, his life other than like, he was probably one of the first, like maybe big, uh, homosexual, um, celebrities that I'm aware of at least. Um, so I imagine that'll be a big part of the film, but yeah, it looks great. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm definitely gonna check it out. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's talk about Overlord. What are your thoughts? I'm stoked. I'm pretty stoked for this movie. I, I shared a poster in the after party today. Yes. Um, uh, for so this tell is- the listeners about what is this film, in case they don't know. Yeah. So <laughs> if you've played Call of Duty World of War and you've played the zombies mode, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> um, because cause that was the original zombies mode. But um, yeah, like more to the point. Um, World World War Two, uh, some kind of viral zombie infection breakout, um, and it's a sort of a horror movie. But it's being produced by JJ Abrams, who is killing it as a producer. Um, and I'm I'm definitely keen for a man. It's getting pretty. It's getting stronger reviews than I initially expected. So um, hopefully, hopefully it'll be pretty good. Uh, everything I've seen from it, including the trailer, looks pretty great. So definitely, definitely keen to check it out, to be honest. I'm, I gotta be honest, pretty skeptical. Outside of, like, the opening stuff with the, the plane crash and stuff, it feels and looks very low budget and a little, like, 2005-y to me. And maybe that's what it is. Maybe it is it's a low budget, almost indie film that J.J. Abrams has saved. Like, he's done that before. Like, He's taken a low budget film and he's like, nah, I'm on this now. So now it gets attention it deserves. And for him to attach himself to it, he must have some sort of faith in it. Um, outside of the concept. I feel like this con I feel like if this movie though came out five years ago, it would have so much more hype around it. Cause like the idea of zombies and this sort of setting was a bit more popular. Well, it's definitely not a concept for everyone. I mean, number one, it's a period piece. Number two, it's a zombie movie. Oh, well, not that. Just like I feel like I feel like the zombie trend has kind of come and gone a little bit. Um, we just talked about Walking Dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like, you know- like, We talked about, yeah. Well, it, it, yeah. That's one of the few examples of it being done successfully. Like a lot of dark and gritty- like, Admittedly, though, there aren't many dark and gritty zombie films out there these days. Um, and it would be nice to see a good one. But like, 
I've always assumed like the reason we're not seeing many is because it's a it's a trend that died and people were over it. But maybe I'm wrong. Like uh, maybe this could even bring back that. Um, I'm 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 still down to see it because it's got zombies in it and guns. So obviously, but um, I'm being carefully. I'm approaching it cautiously. Um, yeah, yeah. But again, as I said, JJ Abrams attached to it, so I've got to have a little faith. Um, nice. Last trailer I want to touch on, man, is oh boy, it's it, it's a film called uh, and this and this trailer came out a few weeks ago. Um, it's a film called Escape Room. It's kind of like I described it as Zoheb as uh, Discount Saw. Um, it's very <laughs> we're trapped in a room. There's weird objects or, or contraptions going on that are trying to kill us. But it's it's Saw except without the wit and without the um the cleverness to it. Like what was good about Saw is like there was a reason for all this stuff and and this it seems like there's like a bit of a mystery going on. But um some of the traps they're in and stuff they seem a little impractical, um which kind of makes it a bit harder for me to ground myself in realism for that. Um it's also a January release, which is generally where movies go to die. That being said, it's not a terrible trailer. Um I don't know. So maybe maybe it'll be okay. Or what do you think? Yeah, uh, I think um, the the trailer looks pretty generic. Um, like, like there are some shots in it that look pretty cool. Like, what they there's a shot where like there's a room and then like the camera tilts upside down and the room's pretty much like intact. Mm. Like it looks the same upside down as it is right way up, which I thought was pretty pretty slick. Um, the, uh, there's no notable actors or, any, or anything in it uh, except Deborah Ann Wall, who plays uh, Karen Page in Daredevil. Um, like I said, I thought the weaker part, the weakest part of Daredevil, so it doesn't really get me hyped. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, like I, when when another trailer comes out for it, I won't even watch it because it's more <laughs> like. It's more it's like, like I, I'm just it. not. We get the concept. Yeah, we, we, we get, get it. it, and I'm just like not. I'm I'm partially interested, but I'm not like fully, fully invested. I, I'll still same. watch it. Yeah. I'll still watch it. I'll I'll keep my eye on the reviews. Like, see which way it slants. If it's all negative, then I'm not gonna probably not even gonna bother. But you know, if there are if it's mid 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 range or positive range, then I'm definitely gonna check it out. So I I'll probably check it out, but only because it's in January and there'll be nothing else to watch. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ! Yeah. Oh yeah, we Look, forgot to mention it's in January. Yeah. Jesus Christ! Well, there's something. There's something like so. I I'm obsessed with the Saw franchise. It's one of my favorite franchises. Even like the ones that people don't like, I still like. Me and a good friend of mine, we we used to watch them religiously every October. Um, but the weaker moments of the Saw franchise would be whenever the traps were unbelievable. Like, how can this one guy or even a couple guys build this? contraption like sometimes it'd just be unrealistic and that would take me out of it a lot um and i feel like this has that written all over it so unless they have some justification like it's done by some evil corporation with millions of dollars or something like that could potentially be um something that ruins it for me because like one of the opening traps they they're in is uh it's like the they're in a room and then like they look on the roof and all the walls turn to like ovens and it's like how do you create an invisible oven like, throughout a whole w- room. I don't know. Maybe they're going to go in some sci-fi shit. I don't know. But um, we'll see what happens. Anywho. Um, <laughs> we mentioned Rockin' Man. Another um, rock star biopic that's recent is Bohemian Rhapsody. Zoheb and I both saw it. So let's get into our spoiler review. <gasps> Bohemian Rhapsody. Let's get into this. Z-Man, what do you reckon? Yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, okay, so just just a disclaimer. We have a special feature coming out, um, like, I, like I mentioned earlier in the episode. Um, that's pretty much just going to be covering uh, Bohemian Rhapsody in detail. Uh, not as detailed as our feature presentation, but detailed all the same. So that's that's going to be with Colin and our good friend Patrick Harrington, and I'm probably going to be on it as well. So I'm going to keep my thoughts on this brief, um, and I'll just be uh, kind of like counterpointing anything that you have to say later and yours. 
but other than that, I'm just going to kind of keep it brief. I like this movie. Um, this was a- <laughs> I thought that was, was going to be it. Like, I like this yeah. movie. The end. Yeah, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> You're right. That was brief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just three, three, three words. Um, um, no, I, I liked it. It um, definitely had a few problems um, in terms of being a little generic. Um, it, it didn't- uh, I kept comparing it to Straight Outta Compton. And there are, like, it's not that, you know, they're the same story. It's just that Straight Outta Compton did this story better. Um, mm. And let me let me get into that a little bit. I'll touch on it a little bit now because I'm going to expand on it uh, on, on, you know, on our next episode. But Straight Outta Compton was about the rise of a, of a, of a I'm going to say band, but they're not technically a band. Yeah. Uh, it's the rise of uh, M- NWA. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say what that stands for because I'm just Sorry. not getting into that. Um, but uh, basically, this this movie, Bohemian Rhapsody, is about the rise of Queen, and but most mostly, it's more about Freddie Mercury than about any one person. Uh, whereas uh, Straight Outta Compton dealt with all of its members uh, pretty equally didn't really slant towards one or the other. Um, it, it dealt with Ice Cube's character, dealt with Dr. Dre, and it dealt with AZE pretty pretty equally. Um, and that was kind of one of the problems that I had with Bohemian. Like, I knew going into it that it was going to be very Freddie Mercury-focused, but I would have liked to see a little bit more from the others. Like, um, I just thought it was a bit... They, they got the short shift a little bit. Um, this, secondly, um, another reason I kept comparing it was because... Straight Outta Compton dealt with uh, a massive social issue, uh, namely racism, whereas this deals with a massive uh, social issue, namely uh, your sexual orientation. And I think Straight Outta Compton dealt with it a little bit, a little bit better. Um, it's just the way the way F. Gary Gray kind of like weaved, weaved racism and social unrest uh, into that story was fantastic. And I just think you know. You can compare those two element, like that element of it, to this movie because, um, being gay in 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 that time frame in that in in the seventies was massive. Mm. Like these days, you know, a lot of people don't even turn their heads. Like you know, it it's it, it's becoming more normal than normal, which it should. But back then, it was a massive thing, and and I don't think that kind of nail was hit on the head as well as it should have been. So that was my second issue with it. Uh, my third issue, again, turning back to Straight Outta Compton. Um, so the lead, the 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 lead singer of 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 NWA died the same way that Freddie Mercury did. Um, he had AIDS. Uh, um, well, they died in different circumstances. Like, like Freddie contracted it through homosexuality and sex. No, like, no, right, like, exactly. He but, was, I mean, they. Like, Pretty much. Oh, no, I know. Just shut up, Matt. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I just make, I had to make no. that clear. Like it was. The, no, the no, no. That's 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 not what I'm saying. I, like like the separate circumstances, but the same disease. Like okay. they like the, the, that's what I'm that's what I'm saying. But the way the movie deals with it, I, I feel like I feel like Bohemian. It is the strongest part of the movie. Like when he's dealing with that and like with the the fallout of that. But I still think it does feel a little bit rushed. Um, I think I think uh, Straight Outta Compton dealt with that a little bit better. Um, but uh, look, just taking away taking taking Straight Outta Compton away from it, I think the first half of Bohemian Rhapsody was not great. Just straight up was not great. It it felt like it rushed through the the formation of Queen very quickly um, and a lot of the scenes just felt a little disjointed. That might be down to, you know, the director issues and the behind the scenes issues. I don't know. But there is a certain point in the movie in Bohemian Rhapsody where it just kind of like like a, a, a switch just flips and it just becomes great. Um, that might have been, I think it might have been somewhere around when they're doing um, Another One Bites to Dust because after that, that's when the movie just becomes kind of like amazing, <laughs> um, and that that entire like live aid sequence was fantastic. And how the hell haven't I talked about Rami Malek yet? Um, Rami Malek killed this movie. He was outstanding. Um, I don't think he's going to win an Oscar though. I'm sorry, but I, I just don't think he's going to. Like he put he turned in a great performance, but there's nothing 
I mean, there's a lot there. There's a lot of substance there, uh, and there's a lot of emotion there. But I don't think it's Oscar worthy. Um, he'll he'll definitely be nominated just because he's nominated. Just because you know, there's this like public outcry of him. You know, and a lot of buzz. But I don't think he's gonna win it. Win it. But other than, other than that, man, like the movie doesn't really have much going for it. Um, you know, the 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 live sequences are, are fantastic. Um. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I I ended up giving it an eight point five, which I think is a little bit high. I do want to check it out again before our next episode. But uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on it. <laughs> what do can, you think? Can I ask before I go? Like, yeah, you you went really heavy in on a lot of the um, negatives there. What makes it get such a high score for you? Like, what, yeah, was there an element that really stood out that in particular that elevated it? Yeah, well, definitely Rami Malek. Like when I say he de- he's he doesn't deserve an Oscar, I know that sounds negative, but I mean, <sighs> like he he transcends the movie. Like he he builds like he elevates the script, but that that doesn't necessarily mean you should win an Oscar. Like, no, do you know what I mean? I agree, uh, I agree. Just um, just because you know you you turn in an amazing performance, I like doesn't mean you should you know win an Oscar. But you know the movie was shot pretty well. Like, you know, it, it's very competent. Um, again, especially the music scenes. I I thought there was a <laughs> like one or two or eight too many montages. Like, <laughs> Jesus, can we fucking relax? Um like it followed the it followed the biopic, the standard biopic structure, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's just a, a thing of the genre, but it didn't really do anything to break through that. Um and look, I know eight point five is a bit high. Like I said, I might I might go to it down to an eight, but even that might be a little too high. It, it just it kind of like it's the second half that really saved it. Um, yeah. I think, especially Live Aid, like that entire like final twenty minutes was fantastic. Cool. Uh right, so my review. Um, I don't have many disagreements with you. Um, so I do think the absolute biggest problem with this film. And I don't even know if you can call it a much of a problem. Is it just, it feels a lot of being there, done that. Um, I wouldn't compare it so much to um, Stray Out Compton as, as you would, but like, I can see why you did. Um, for me, it's, it's just like, I've seen a hundred rock star films like this. It, you could even play it out beat by beat. Like they meet, they go around the world, they get really famous. Oh no, fame made me an asshole. Now I'm doing drugs. I pushed everyone I love away in my life. Let's get back for one more show. The end. Like I've seen that film through it through it thirty times. Um, that being said, though, God damn, this is a fun movie. This could be in my top five most fun movies of the year. Maybe not not my favorite, but definitely. One of the most fun films I've seen. I didn't realize how many Queen songs I actually really do care about. Um, and that's that's the the biggest thing this film has going for it. The fact that it has Queen's music in it. Like, if you took this band out and made it about another band but kept the exact same script and just changed the songs, this movie would be nowhere as good. Um, Dude, I, 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 sorry, I, I know yeah. I, 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 I shouldn't right. interrupt, but like, I completely agree with you there. Like, this isn't my genre at all. Like, you know, my genre, yeah. it's, it's very, like, you know, it's trance, it's, it's house, like, it's, you know, very dancey. Um, but I've been going on these, like, walks in the morning. Like, <laughs> all I've been listening to is Queen now. <laughs> like, it's just, it's just because it's just so, so energetic. Uh, Freddie Mercury is just fantastic. Um, like, it, it's so, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Queen's music is definitely something special. And, and, and well, this has got me really thinking because it's it's got me into thinking. And I don't want to d- dive too far away, but it's like I'll watch a movie like maybe one of the 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 worser off Spider Man movies, and I think, why am I still watching this? It's like, because I love Spider Man, and that's how that's what this movie's like. It's like I'm watching it because it's Queen, and I'm having fun because it's Queen. But everything around the fact that it's Queen isn't as amazing. Um, that being said, like, it's still there, so it's fun. And that's what's making the movie fun. So that's not a criticism. Um, it's just that's right. that's that's just one of the yeah. strengths of it. Um, See, I was I was trying to say that, but I think I think yeah, you vocalized it a lot better. That's another reason like my score is so high, because it is it is queen. Like you yeah. are seeing the formation of one of the best bands of all time. And it feels like Le- them too. 
Right, exactly, and led by one of the greatest frontmans of frontmen of all time. Like you know, yeah, man, and um, that's what it is. And like that goes to like one of the other good um compliments for the film. And this might seem weird to compliment it for this, but like for the most part, it actually looked like they were playing the songs. They were they were believable performances. And when I say performances, I'm not saying acting performances. I'm saying musical performances. Um, I could tell at some very small moments of the film that he was lip syncing. But, like, very few. Um, it was done so convincingly well. And even more so, the instruments. Like, um, when I heard, like, they kind of had to learn the instruments or get better at them, it's like, what the fuck? Um, the characters actually, the actors look like their counterparts, especially that guitarist. Like, if they were, if that, you told me he was his son, I'd believe you. Um, but, yeah. <coughs> this film... Bless I, you. Thank you again. Um, I feel like getting, this, the, getting the sniffles over there, mate. Yeah, man. Sorry. Um, but I feel like <laughs> no, hey, it's, it's fine. What makes this? I feel like what this film rest sets, in peace to the headphone listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suckers, you're fucked now. Um, <laughs> what are you gonna do about it? Uh, please, please don't turn off. Please don't turn off. Don't unsubscribe. Please don't unsubscribe. I love you. I'll suck your dick. Please, please come back. Okay. Um, <laughs> and one star. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, the re- I can just see the iTunes review now. He actually begged me not to unsubscribe <laughs> after sneezing into the mic. Um, yeah, so so this film, um, it's really fun. And I feel like that's what they set out to do. They didn't set out to, and I feel the same way about Straight Out Compton, and this is where I will compare it. I feel like both films did not set out to tell a faithful and accurate representation of the life, of these lives. In fact, there are a lot of scenes you can sort of tell and where they've actually manufactured them just so they can get a point across better or just so they can make a reference. One, one example is is a great one. Um, I didn't realize it was him because it was so good. But Mike Myers is seen in this um, where he plays a record executive um, who didn't exist in real life. Apparently, the scene was made so it can um, fulfill yeah, a bunch of ones. Over the weekend, yeah. yeah. And so he's meant to represent like five different ones. But the reason they, they, they cast Mike Myers is- uh, back in, I think it was the 80s or late 90s when they did Wayne's World, he has a, there's a famous scene where they um, released Bohemian, they jam out to Bohemian Rhapsody. And um, that helped repopulize that song and he helped get it back into the charts. And so as like, and like they're in the car banging to the song. And so Mike Myers gets this line in this film where it goes, no one will ever uh, bang their heads in a car to Bohemian Rhapsody. So that's like a, they went through all this work just to make one meta joke for fan service and Easter eggs. Yeah. Which is cool. And i am but like, that's not a criticism because um, if they did what really happened, it would have been an extra six scenes of hearing the same thing over and over again. And that wouldn't have been good cinema. Um, so that's the thing I commend both this film and Strat Compton for is the fact that they, they are willing to dive away from what actually happens sometimes for the sake of entertainment. Because that's what a film is meant to be. If you want to hear the truth, you read a book. If you want to be entertained, you watch the movie. Um, and I like that. I love that, actually. Um, and yeah, the, the music performances are the best part. Um, I really, really also love the visual style of this film. It's so glamorous and beautiful and, and pretty and it's in your face. It's very- yeah, very, very 70s slash 80s, right? Yeah. But even like the, the way they use colors too, it was like, it was very, it was much like Queen's Queen the Band. It was very like- in your face and flamboyant. I want to say flamboyant. I'm trying to think of another word, but I think flamboyant's the best one. It's very um they're they're putting on a show. It's a big spectacle. Bombastic. Everything's a it's yeah. spectacle, I think's the word. Everything they're doing is they're putting on a big spectacle. And that's just, what keeps it interesting. And they do the same with the sure. pacing. Like everything, they're never there for too long. Um, but that does dive into the one other big problem I have with this film, which is and I feel actually I said the same thing about um First Man where they just never get deep enough. They keep touching on topics, but it's all on the surface. And, like, I just want to get to know these characters a bit better. Like, I feel like- Right. They did a better job of getting- of me getting to know Freddie Mercury better than I did with Neil Armstrong and First Man. That's for sure. But well, still- like, I'm not, I'm not going to touch on our disagreement with, with First Man. Yeah, because I know you, you think it's perfect. I thought it was yeah. just above average. But, um, um, but, like, what I liked about- or what I wanted to see more out of this film um, is that I, I didn't get enough time to get to know him. Um, I, and, then, and then even more so the bandmates. Like, this movie 
Especially uh, the band mates. Yeah, like, leading into it, like, the marketing tour and everything we heard, especially the controversy with Sasha Baron Cohen, which clearly they've clearly changed the script a lot since he's seen it or whatever he knew. But um, this film's all about Freddie Mercury. It's not about Queen. But they kept saying, no, it's about Queen, how great we are as a band. But then you see it, it's like, no, it's about Freddie Mercury. There are very small moments in the film where you do get to see the band members shine. And I actually like those and I wanted more. Like, I like the fact that we got to see that Freddie Mercury didn't come up with We Will Rock You. You know, I like the yeah. fact that we saw that. I like the fact that um, especially the drummer had a lot of personality. Like, he was like the womanizer of the group. He had some stuff going on. Um, but, yeah, that's, we didn't get enough time with his family, I feel. Yeah. I wanted more of I that. Think- and I think this is where the movie can be separated in terms of quality from Straight Outta Compton. So Straight Outta Compton, man, that was going for an Oscar. Like, yeah, you get to it, know it, the characters, their families, right. their motivations. It was it was, it was it was nominated for best writing, original screenplay. Like, this is not going for an Oscar, but I think it, it's 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 a Freddie Mercury movie. It's not a Queen movie, and I'm I'm just gonna put it out there, gonna say it. It's it's it is a Freddie Mercury movie. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Like no, that it's being not. said, but no, it's not. Um, and I and I I don't want to fault it for that. I, and I sorry, I wouldn't fault it for that if I we got to actually get to know Freddie Mercury more. But we we didn't, and I feel like one of the reasons maybe we didn't get into that that inside. We we got a bit of it, but I feel like the reason we didn't get a lot of it is they were very. And it's another negative. They, were, they shied a lot away from his sexuality, like. I know there was some controversy with the first trailer because it made it look like he didn't, he wasn't gay at all. But now he's clearly gay in this film. There's actually a good scene with that um, that uh, person in his life. No, no, not the butler. I'm talking when she goes, when he goes, I think I'm oh, bisexual. Because yeah. no, Freddie, you're gay. I've known for yeah, a while. Like uh, that I was name Mary. I think. Yeah, Mary. Uh, um, and I just don't know what to call her. Like, it's co- she's sort of like a partner in his life, but she's really pretty. Yeah, it's it's like um, they. He saw her kind of like a lover, except without the sexual elements. Um, yeah, I think I think they kind of turned it down because it's PG thirteen. Like that's another thing. A movie about it? Freddie Mercury that is PG thirteen. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, whereas straight out of Compton, and I look, I had I had to keep bringing it up, but it's just for me in my mind, it's so easy to compare. Straight out of Compton it's a great is, biopic is, too. Yeah. is R. It, like yeah. that's R, and like that deals with some hard shit. And like, you really um, can't do straight out of Compton without that because of like the language and stuff. But maybe right, that's what they should have done for. Bohemian Rhapsody. Now I can tell you straight up why they made it PG thirteen. Yeah, it's because it again, feel a little sanitized. They want to they want to promote this to as many people as possible because mm-hmm. the thing is, two executive producers on, of this film are members of the band and they are still doing shows. In fact, the week this film was released, they went on um, what was it James Corden live and they announced a huge North American tour. Um, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know that. yeah. They did it with um with the new singer um. Adam Lambert, who currently does, and they had a whole big sing-off where they did a whole bunch of their classics, and they made it like funny because James was singing with dude. Them. But yeah, <laughs> it's, it's produced by De Niro. Oh and, yeah, he uh, produ- he was a producer on it. Yeah, and Jim Beach, you know, the Jim Beach was yeah. that lawyer. Remember yeah. how he's like, "I'm going to call you Miami." Yeah. Um. So yeah, the whole Queen guys were behind this, and that's I think part of the reason why it took so long to develop this film because they. In, in, the, in the words of Sasha Baron Cohen, who almost played Freddie Mercury, they're amazing musicians, but they're not great producers. Um, and obviously, this movie turned out great. They assembled a great team. And they did a good job. But I'm worried that maybe behind the scenes, all this was done to kind of just be a big promotion for them so they can sell more shit. Like, they touch on the greatest hits. They It they, could have been, like, they, a, they, a mutual understanding. Uh, yeah, but, like, I feel like they, they dive away from any controversy too much. And you know, when you mentioned PG-13, man, that explains so much to me. Because, like, do we ever see him even kiss a guy? I don't think so. Yeah, we do. We yeah, do? we do. Because, yeah. like, when you first see him, when it's implied that he's gay, right? He's on the phone to Mary, and then, like, a guy walks into a bathroom, and he's sort of, like, looking at him. And stuff. No, we do, we get an extended scene where he kiss. He yeah, kisses but that's men. later on. Yeah. But like the first member, most like part of that, which was like that slow mo scene with the guy walking in the bathroom, he looks at him. It sort of implies mm. that they might have had sex, but they don't actually tell you or show you. And there's a lot of other moments where he almost does, but you never see it. And like I think yeah, there is like a moment, but like you never see him in bed with a guy. 
No. You do though with Mary. Like they I feel like they just maybe they were trying to play it a little too safe. Um which is ironic because this could have been seen as such a massive LGBT pride film. Um which it probably was what it should have been. And it was to an extent. Like it did a lot of good things. Like one one thing you mentioned the AIDS. Um one good thing that this film did that I don't know if Australia Compton did as well. Um, although I do consider Compton a much superior film, um, is they really upped the threat of AIDS. Like, I loved seeing how- Oh, I didn't love it, but, like, I, it was good how they showed, like, he's watching TV, and he's sort of, it's almost like he's learning about it. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, but I think like that kind that of- also, well. They do, but I think that also kind of plays into the, um, the, 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 oh, sorry, the sexuality- um, part of the, the the movie that it tries to explore, like like just trying to yeah. figure out your sexuality and things, because like Compton can't do that. Compton's dealing with race, yeah. so it can't really. Oh, that's that's yeah. a good point. Um, mm. and that that sort of leads into uh, another thing. Okay, yeah. well, first of all, we got I got to mention like because I haven't yet. Um, the performance obviously amazing. Um, uh, as Freddie Mercury, that was fucking amazing, and um, that live eight scene. Um, which on paper. Sounds like it should be shit because it's just oh, and then they spend the next twenty minutes of the film right. just it's, playing it's the song after song. Performance, yeah, uh, it's, it's the entire performance. Yeah, pretty much. But um, they fucking nailed it. Um, and I loved how like, even the crowd was clearly CGI. I liked that. It just added to the spectacle somehow. Um, and because they set up the stakes of like he was struggling to perform and he was dying, and this is kind of like his last show or one of his last shows. It made the rewards so much more rewarding um and that was that was really well how they did that um and the last point i do think i got to mention up um you mentioned how the first half felt really slow to you not as good i've heard a lot of people say that too and i admit there's almost no drama in the first half of the film i don't i'm not fully against that i usually am with a film but the pacing was so well done and the music was so fun. I was able to forgive it for that. Um, I didn't notice it really until I went back in hindsight. Um, and that's there. Yeah, this film's biggest strength is it's fun. Um, so all up, I know we kind of mixed our conversation with my review, which is totally fine. But um, I think I give it an eight as well. Um, yeah, like this film, if it wasn't Queen, like we'd be looking at like a six because it's pretty generic and, uh, even though it's oh maybe a seven because it's got a really good um lead performance, but god damn this film is so fun and um I'd watch it again. It was really fun and it's definitely it's definitely got me and not just me my mum as well who uh we're on constantly on YouTube now just looking up interviews of Freddie Mercury and stuff. It's so fun. Um, so that's an eight for both of us. I just remembered, dude. I got to tell you an amazing story. Um, a real quick anecdote. In case you haven't seen my Instagram. Um, so I saw this movie with my family. I've never been in the movie with my family. It was my mom, my dad, my sister, myself. Really? Yeah, never. Um, my family isn't really into the arts or movies that much. Um, it's, a, it's a thing I've developed myself. In fact, this is how much my family is not into the movies. I discovered that night that my, this is the first movie my dad had seen in the cinema in 30 years. His last wow. film w- that he saw was 1981 um, wow. when he was dating my mum. Yeah. This is his first time in a cinema in 30 years. Even movies, he very rarely watches movies. He'll watch documentaries on like Netflix and stuff. But you know what he does love to watch? Music DVDs. Um, he, he loves his Led Zeppelin. He loves all that. And he, he, he likes Queen. So, And my dad loved this movie. He loved it. And- the whole time I was like looking over at him, like See, that's, that's trying awesome, to get dude. him. Yeah, and um, even my mum, like she's been in the movies a few times, but she refuses to pay over twelve dollars. Um, but she, she, they were, they couldn't be- like they were acting like it was ins- like they couldn't believe it. My mum's like, "What? Right. How come the seats are recliners?" And like, because that's what it is. It's the extreme <laughs> screens, adorable. right? And oh, you're gonna love this, dude. You know, dude, when you, like- when you, you know, here's the best part. You ready? Yeah. When we walk in, so you know, you know, we're at Blacktown Hall. It's going to the extreme screen. And they're like, you know, they've got lights on the ground. Like, so, like, a yeah. few lights are there. My dad's yeah. just, like, amazed. He's like, this is like I'm in Vegas. 
I'm like, what? He's like, I feel like I'm in America. This is like Vegas. I'm like, that's awesome. This is not Vegas. That's adorable. Uh, See, man, like this this movie wasn't made for nitpicky cunts like us. Yeah, like, you know, yes. the general the general going audience is actually loving this. Like, I'm going to talk about it uh, with Colin and Patrick uh, in our next episode, but. The discrepancy between critic, the critics' reviews and the audience reviews is huge. Like, this is sitting at 8.4 on IMDb, and I think it's uh, 49 on Rotten Tomatoes. Might be wrong. Yeah, okay. But, yeah, it's it, it's crazy. Well, dude, this, this adds to our ongoing weekly conversation about um, expectations, and I feel like this movie is a great example of giving the crowd, the audience, what they want. You know, right. they, yeah. they, they, they didn't want to see a sad, like if you gave us a sad movie about dealing with AIDS, no way this film would be doing as well. Um, it, it would have, it would have like brought up awareness and stuff like that. And that would have been praise, but like, it wouldn't have been a very fun movie. Um, sure. They delve, they, they dive into it enough for us to get that drama. But, um, this, like when you think of queen, you think of fun, you think of amazing, um, like just amazing shit and we want a celebration of freddie mercury's life and we, we got that so this is a great example of giving the audience and living up to their expectations um and this, that's the power of doing that um when you sort of take a risk and and try to go away from the expectations of what that genre might be or what that franchise might be you're you're risking it you might you might be making a better movie but you might be alienating your fan base or your audience. And that's, yeah, that's a, that's always a risky move. And again, like I've said this a hundred times, I think, and you've agreed with me a hundred times. Like that's the one, that's one of the biggest compliments I can give the last Jedi, which is it took a fucking risk. It fucking, it swung. And so people hated it for it, but I'm like, you know what? Say what you want about the film, but I can respect the director for at least having the balls to try something different with star Wars. Um, and I as a conversation for another day. Yeah, then. and I brought that up because I knew you'd stab me if I mentioned Venom again. Anyway, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I was gonna pull out my knife. Yeah. So, anyways, um, because that film also explains my expectations, but it's gone. Um, we th- this is Midnight Double Feature. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes. Please give us a review if you like the show, um, as well as anywhere else that fucking matters. Um. We release uh, usually about two episodes a week, upcoming attractions and feature presentations. Um, we hope you enjoy the show. Um, please, if you want to hang out with us, share some memes with us, share some news. Um, post it in our community page, The After Party on Facebook. Um, the After Party Midnight Double Feature. Some of the stories we talk about in these upcoming attractions episodes were um, posted in there by listeners like you. Um, and that's how sometimes we find the content. That's how we know what you guys want to listen to sometimes. Um, a lot of it's just me just going, ooh, that looks cool. I want to bitch about that. But um, <laughs> a lot of it is um, thanks to your listeners. Like, we really uh, appreciate um, everyone Absolutely. who listens and, and all that. And I'm just so proud and love this community that, that's been started here. And, um, yeah, please, please reach out to us if you have if you want us to mention anything in the show, if you like to – Got any suggestions, feedback? Do I talk too much? Should I shut up? Should we be focusing on less stories? Should we only be doing reviews? I don't know. Lay it on us. Let us know how to improve um, and, and give you the show that you want to hear because um, we're kind of just winging it, but we're having fun, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely, man. This is, I, I, love, I, look, I look forward to these, to these episodes and our feature presentations, man. Like the Podcasting has changed my life. I love it. Fantastic. That's a beautiful note to end on. So uh, until next week, thanks again, guys. Catch ya. (laughs) 